All right, Devin, so nice to meet you. Thanks for doing this with me, whatever this is going to be. <laughs> I just saw you on YouTube and saw you also have a similar microphone as I do. So I thought we should chat. I listened to your examples and I really like your unconventional way of recording stuff and thinking about binaural audio. So let's just have a talk and see what <laughs> what's going to happen. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, th thanks for, for talking to me. This is great. Nice. So I was wondering, how did you get to what you're doing right now? And how did you get to binaural audio? I would say it started back when I was in college and I was introduced to the Neumann head, the microphone that's shaped like the human head, right? I, I thought it was pretty cool. And I, I think there was a YouTube video in the early days of YouTube where there was a barbershop experience. Someone was giving you a haircut on you wear headphones and it's like, oh no, it's so funny and weird. And I remember thinking at the time, I was getting into surround sound in general, and I discovered the uh, binaural processor in Logic. And so I was playing around with that, and I just thought, there's so much potential here, you know, this is so cool. And I didn't really do much with it. I was more concentrated on live sound and stuff like this, but I saw a, a great potential for for this kind of technology and obviously it's come a long way. Nice. Can you talk a little bit more about the Logic uh, Binaural Processor? I'm not sure if I'm familiar with that. Like what did it do? Yeah, there's a there's a binaural spatial processor in Logic. It's just a plug-in and basically you can take a mono input source or a stereo input source. I, I think even you can take a surround input source and basically just pan it around in a binaural space. And it's, it's actually pretty good. So you can sort of mimic the sort of binaural spatial aspect with headphones that you would get if you'd done it with a binaural microphone of sorts. Interesting. Yeah, this is literally what I am doing now with my life, doing messing around with all those spatializers. I come with from, from the VR background and just see what makes sense to record spatially. So I was wondering what's your approach to even using binaural audio and when are you like, oh, Modo will just do fine? I mean, the the spatial thing is interesting because there's a couple of initial challenges to it with the binaural microphone in a room. You you do get you do get sort of more of a I would almost call it a documentary style representation of what's happening in the room. Like this is literally what it would sound like if you were just standing here. But that's not always the way that we want to hear music, you know. Then then one issue there is when you're listening to that recording, you are sort of separating yourself from the physical reality of being there in that space and actually experiencing the the sense of the room. It's not just your sense of, of hearing, it's the sight, it's the smell, it's the physicality of being in the space that kind of all comes together in this experience that when you just isolate the audio aspect of it, I thought that this technology has these certain benefits, but it also has certain limitations. So would you say, well, what's more important, having the experience of being there with a dummy head or having a bass drum that has punch? Well, it doesn't depend. Well, there's certain things I thought that could be done to enhance the binaural technology. And um, so there's a couple things that, that came to mind initially, and that was the need to balance the binaural uh, experience of the total space. I sort of likened it to, you know, how we think some reptiles are, are their vision is based on motion, right? And if nothing moves, they just can't see things. That kind of happens to the binaural sense when there's no relative motion in the space. You lose the sense of the 3D aspect to the space and then it flattens out to like just a bad version of a stereo recording. It just felt like there was a lot of attempts that were being made that were based on a more philosophical approach to the technology. Like this is the correct way to do this. That resulted in a lot of these anemic types of recordings that nobody actually wanted to listen to. Uh, uh, so what made you record binaural audio and messing around with it and uploading it on YouTube? Like, why did you do that? <laughs> I mean, I feel like, oh, there's so much more I would want to do with such a microphone, but there's just so little time. So I appreciate that you did that. But <laughs> what made you do that? 
how it came about in the first place was just that when COVID hit and everyone was sort of not doing live sound and stuff, I decided I'm, I'm bored out of my mind. I want to do something. So I decided to put together a kind of mobile recording package and find some classical music players. Um, and then the idea was that we would stream it live to people wearing headphones. Uh, unfortunately, we never got that far. The live event industry sort of picked up again enough that that took up all my time. But basically, we made some test recordings to just see if the technology, the whole setup, and the mobile recording package would even work. And I just decided to post those on YouTube, and I, I had the brand around it called Alpha Stream. But like that, I, all I got around to doing was just posting a couple of basic bino recordings in the sort of more traditional style that I actually don't really like. <laughs> and so, yeah, unfortunately, I just I personally have not been able to do much serious work that does a lot of these things that I really hope other people are doing with the binaural tech. Uh, I saw that you recommend a specific pair of headphones. I also got it here, right, right there. And I was rather wondering, because most of the time people talk about buying expensive headphones to get the best audio quality, and then you decide to, to get a $10 pair of headphones and make people buy it to experience your binaural work as good as possible. Like, why? Because it's accessible or what, what's the deal? Yeah, so that was part of the alpha stream concept initially was just that we needed to figure out how to get high quality audio to potential listeners on the internet. And the big problem is just that you don't have end to end control. You can put great sounding content out into the internet, but you don't know what devices people are going to be listening on. So I was like, there's got to be a way to get cheap headphones to sound good. And this is where I went on this little journey. I actually went into a store and this actually makes me sound like a terrible person, but I was like, okay, fine. What's your return policy? So I just like <laughs> bought a bunch of headphones, cheap headphones, expensive headphones, took them out to my car in the parking lot and basically just did a big comparison between all of them. And I was very surprised just based on sound quality alone. My two favorite ones were like $400 pair of headphones. And then this little cheap $10 pair of these Sony Buds. And I, I was like really blown away by the Sony Buds just out of the gate. I bought a couple different pairs of them later on to see if the consistency was the same, the sound of them was the same. And, and now years and years later, I keep buying various pairs and comparing them. To, and they have a really consistent sound. So then I, I basically just developed an EQ that makes them sound really, really smooth. And I, I mean, I can't say that they sound as good with the processing as a thousand dollar pair of custom in-ears. Those probably sound a little bit better. But the point is for $10 and a little bit of EQ, they sound pretty good. And at least what you get from that is the end to end. You know exactly what hardware the, the end user is going to be listening to your content on. And then you can, ahead of time, tweak the sound of your content into perfection for that piece of hardware specifically, just like a live sound engineer does for live sound, right? So I felt like there was just a lot of potential there that unfortunately I, I personally just did not get to pursue. But I know that there's people doing great work in like gaming and stuff. And this is the way this technology should be used. I really like what you say because this is like the biggest misconception that you need a special pair of headphones to experience 3D audio. I guess that's more like the marketing lie. They tell you to buy new headphones. So I really appreciate you trying to make it work for small headphones. And as you mentioned, hey, use movement and be the reptile thing that you meant. Don't get blind and yeah, just mess around with it and then see where the potential of the technology is. So yeah, I dig your approach. I was wondering if you already tried tools that cancel out the frequency curve that every uh, headphone has. And for me, it was honestly a game changer because most of the time I work a lot with HRTFs and every HRTF is random. And then you have a random pair of headphones and you never really know how the sound will sound like. So did you already mess around with that? At least what I thought about doing at one point was actually uh, taking and making the same kinds of EQ setting I had made for this particular headphone, right? The Sony EX15 LP. And just doing that for a wide range of headphones and then kind of maybe having an app that you could download on your phone that would basically take over the audio from the device and process it in this way. So you could always just select which headphone brand you're using and then it will apply that EQ to your audio out on your device. 
But, you know, that came about because I was so frustrated with recording projects in college that I was working on. I would send them around to various people, either collaborators or people that I wanted second opinions on. And I would send a little, a pair of headphones with the oh, USB nice. stick. I say, listen to this project with these headphones and then don't tell me what you think about it until you've done that. That way I at least know that we heard the same thing. And that was something that I learned pretty quickly on was that the human ear is so sensitive to tonal changes and what your brain interprets as natural is a really, really narrow window. And it's one thing that I noticed early on was that once you put the headphones on and you hear that the 3D sense of the binaural technology, your brain is already automatically operating in a kind of sense. There's like a known standard here and that is natural. And I saw a lot of people missing the mark on that because when you put a pair of headphones and you're listening to music that's recorded in a binaural sense, they may have done a great job with the spatial aspect of it, but since there's no control of the tonal aspect of it, your brain is already telling you this isn't real. It's not truly convincing. I'm not getting the sense of being lost in this space and being convinced by it. So those are big things that I see as, as real problems that still have not been addressed at a popular level by people trying to apply the binaural technology to music. Super interesting. I think what most of the people always get wrong is if they listen to a mix on headphones and then on loudspeakers, it's not just that you're listening on a different uh, pair of device. It's also you're listening in a different room. If you take a loudspeaker to another room, the mix will again sound differently. So I feel you. I totally had that with binaural mixes, like people were confused. So that's yeah, still yeah. part of the game, I suppose. I was wondering, what do you think about immersive audio in the context of live sound? You know, the immersive thing is kind of the wild, wild west right now. You know, there's every everyone's experimenting and trying their own stuff. It's not just about what you can dream up. In the live sound industry, a lot of it is what's feasible. There's There's lots of things that we could think would be cool to do, but also, like, can we do it? And a lot of companies are trying to find what can we do that can also be done by smaller regional companies like Alpha Sound, for example. I've done a lot of immersive stuff, but it's always just been a, of my own making and my own experimentation. You know, and for my purposes at this point in time, it just makes more sense for me to do it myself. But maybe that'll change. But I think that there's at least two ways to think about doing the immersive thing. There's like the more playful or gimmicky way of doing it. It's like, oh, look, we can put the saxophones behind you. Ha ha ha, there's now saxophones behind you. Isn't that cool? It's super fun to have thunder from behind you or something flying around you in space. You know, for, for the home theater world, right? That's made a lot of sense. A musical thing, I think people are still trying to find what the point or purpose of this is. And for classical music applications, a lot of the point has been to try to bring a sense of an acoustic space to places that have an imperfect or, or non-existent acoustic space. So I've been trying to concentrate more on that. Uh, we did an event with a local orchestra a couple years ago at a winery. Beautiful views of the surrounding vineyards outdoors, but we set up a surround sound system and made it sound like it was in an acoustic hall. Uh, that was really fun. I've done a bunch of stuff like that, but so far that's kind of been the thing that I've gravitated towards, but I haven't really done a whole lot of the sort of thing where you take the sound sources and spread them around and have them fly around like Tinkerbell. I haven't really done a lot of that. So I don't know. This has been really fun. We should do this again. Um, I have like 80 more things I'd love to talk to you about, but I have to run. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we're both very busy. Likewise. Um, but yeah, yeah, this is great, great chat. And uh, Devin. yeah, definitely let's do this again sometime. Thanks for taking your time. It was a pleasure. And yeah, talk soon. All right. <laughs> Cheers.